Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jens, for inviting me and for everyone for showing up. This is uh, super exciting, and I'm I'm really glad to get to to present this again. And I, I can absolutely keep talking about this for as long as people want to stay. Um, I am going to try and keep it to about to about an hour uh, for the main talk, but I'm happy to go through more slides in a breakout room. I'm happy to interact on Twitter or wherever else. There's lots of fun stuff to be learned here. And like I've been learning a lot about this talk by putting it together and everything. Um, I'm going to take out one of my headphones so I'm not yelling so much. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, this is the talk I gave back at CPPCon 2020 about five days ago, four days ago. And I um, had a lot of fun with this talk. And so part of the goal of this talk is to have a lot of fun, kind of laughing at some obscurities in C++, but also to kind of see what we can learn from them, see what we can learn about how like real production code should look and act and stuff based on these uh, tricks. So let's see if my slides are advancing. There we go. Um, so goals, some goals for this talk. Yeah, like I said, let's have some fun geeking out about how weird C++ is sometimes. Um, well, that doesn't apply, but it's probably been a long week for someone. Um, and sometimes you have to laugh to keep from crying. Um, let's learn something new about how C++ works by using it in a way that's so bizarre. You really can't forget about it when it comes up in real code. And these things do come up in real code. Like I would say 30% of these things that I've, these tricks that I've tweeted, um, I've seen in real code or seen the consequences of in real code or seen the fact that someone doesn't know how the underlying mechanism works, come back to bite someone in real code. Um, and so that's an important uh, thing to know. Um, sorry, my cat is in my room and I did not realize my cat was in my room. So this will be fun. Um, and yeah, let's learn, hopefully learn the right thing. But uh, also I kind of want to try and teach people how to learn and how to, how to play with C++ uh, in ways that kind of elucidate how dark corners of the language interact. and. That's um, a lot of what this whole cute tricks tweet series is about is is learning to to play around with C++ in ways that will learn something new that can then be applied to real code. Um, and yeah, two C++ standards defects reports have been filed as a result of writing this talk. So there's there are useful actual uh, applications here. Some disclaimers, uh, don't use these tricks in real code. Um, if someone tries to cite this talk in a code review as like, hey, this is what you should do, uh, show them this slide and say like, uh, no, Daisy said, don't use this in real code. Um, but use these things to help you understand code. This is not a software engineering talk. This is you know, well-written code should be unsurprising and kind of the whole point of this talk is to to talk about some little code snippets that are surprising and because they're surprising, they'll stick in your memory a little bit. Um, I definitely have a problem with my talks about getting too into the weeds, but sorry, this talk is all weeds. Um, and this talk is actually several mini talks and it's probably going to be part one of N, as I said on the title slide. Um, I have about about 30 of these that I'd really like to expand out into kind of talk segment length um, pieces. And I got through about five of them in this first uh, talk. So I plan to keep doing this at whatever venues will have me uh, for as long as it's useful to people. But I really enjoyed making this talk. I really enjoyed giving this talk. Um, so I hope you will too. Anyway, here we go. Um, Let's jump into this this first trick. Um, I generally, I mean, I don't know how we're going to do things online, but I generally will try and stop and answer questions. I think at the end of each kind of mini talk, the, each one of the the tricks, uh, unless there's a good stopping point in the middle. Um, if people would like to interrupt or or have other thoughts in between, that's uh, totally fine. 
to. Um, I may or may not see them. I'm gonna like very intentionally though check over to the Q and A and check over to the chat in between each of the segments. So let's jump into this this first segment. Um, this is the tweet. I left it in the talk so that if you're following along on the slides online, um, I posted a link to the slides in the, the chat. So hopefully everyone should have some access to them. Uh, but you should be able to pull up the tweet, take a look at some of the discussion around it. There's always some very interesting discussions around it, either now or after the talk. Um, this one was surprisingly surprising to me how popular this was. So this this is the, the trick in a nutshell is that you can iterate backwards through a parameter pack by folding over a right associative operator like assignment, for instance. Um, and it turns out there's a little bit more to it than that, but let's we'll, we'll get to that in a second. It's not the actual associativity of the operator that's causing this to happen, but you should see why I said that um, that's more or less correct in it. So what are we doing here? I think this is the part that really caught people's attention is that this really compact piece of code does something so surprising. I think people have a notion that um, terse and short pieces of code should do something obvious. And the reality is that when you're writing uh, readable code, when you're writing maintainable code, it's often things that are that are very much not terse that end up doing things that aren't uh, that are obvious and things that are terse are often surprising. So it's a good rule of thumb to think about it's as when you're writing code for production, think about like, am I, is this too short, right? If this is too short, it might be surprising. And so that's not a good idea. But in the case, this case, I was trying to be surprising and I think I succeeded. So when you're doing some generic, pro when you're doing generic programming, you often find yourself in this situation where you have this parameter pack uh, with the dot, dot, dots, that basically means that you have one symbol representing multiple entities, right? In this example, the one symbol T's, um, lowercase T's, represents one, two, hello, three, four, world, right? So it's all one symbol, and you need some way to do something with it that um, goes across those symbols, right? Um, so, uh, in this example, we've kind of created this, this inline um, lambda here that's just an easy way of doing something that we can see. Um, in this case, it's just printing out the argument, right? All of these arguments uh, can be used with the stream operator and so and, and see out. So we're just printing it out. Uh, and then we return the type identity avoid. Um, this is uh, just an example of anything with a reasonable assignment operator will work here. I mean, I could have used, um, yeah, any number of things, but the type identity avoid was a simple one to use. And it is a new feature in C20 that's um, lots of fun, but uh, is beside the point here. Um, so if you return something here that, you know, had a deleted assignment operator, obviously this whole thing wouldn't work. But uh, since we have a well behaved one here, this, this code generates um, backwards iteration and forwards iteration through the parameter pack. And let's we're going to go through that in a second as to why that is. These are fold expressions. I'm going to go through what that is. Don't worry if you don't know what a fold expression is. Um, I'm going to go through that too, but uh, that's the general trick. I'm just trying to take my time going through this so that everyone has some time to absorb what's going on here. Um, I had some really interesting reactions to this one. Uh, Alistair Meredith said that he wishes he'd figured it out for himself. Michael Park, uh, terrifyingly enough, says he's used this in actual code, um, which I don't doubt is wrong. Michael Park is a fantastic programmer. It's just that uh, it's a little bit terrifying that it's come to this. Um, uh, someone else said this is absolute wishcraft, which I hope by the end of these slides you will find out you won't feel that that's the case. Um, so. Here is um, the very simple version of what's going on here, right? We have this print one function, and if we feed it an argument, it prints it out. And we're ignoring the return value in this particular case, and that's that's completely fine. Um, if we use the comma operator here, right? So the comma operator is something you can overload in C++. Um, this is an, a non-overloaded version, right? This just 
takes and discards the result of the first expression and then returns the result of the second expression. But we're ignoring this, the result of the second expression, so it doesn't matter either, right? And the comma operator evaluates the first argument, print one on hello, and then evaluates the second argument, print one on world, and does it in that order. And the um, assignment operator does the opposite. It evaluates print one on world and then evaluates print one on hello. And um, so there was some suspicion as to like, why is this? And uh, one of the, I think the best comments I got was uh, Sylvester Hess um, on Twitter responded that operator associativity doesn't apply here uh, since the fold expression is what's determining the associativity and creates parentheses, which of course parentheses override associativity. Associativity is just another word for saying where do parentheses go by default if there's any question as to where they should go? Um, and yeah, uh, they're absolutely right. They, um, but C++, uh, as a general rule, C++ deterministically evaluates right associative operators from right to left, evaluates the arguments to right associative operators. And we'll see where that was added to the standard and when that was added to the standard and how you can rely on that. Um, and uh, Sylvester also points out quite correctly that um, the, there is a right associative operator in the standard that doesn't devalue it from right to left, and that's for very good reasons, I think, and that's the ternary operator. Um, so why uh, were some experts at C++ somewhat confused by this behavior? Um, well, so this, this first statement in intro to execution says that except where otherwise noted, evaluations of individual operands are unsequenced, right? So people, some people commented with the fact that like, are you sure you can rely on that? I don't understand. I'm surprised that this is actually deterministically happening. Are you sure you're just not running it in enough compilers or whatever? Um, and in fact, it, in pre-C++ 17, this would have been the case, but we added some significant cleanup to this in C++ 17, uh, where uh, we specified that uh, expressions separated by a comma, so the comma uh, arguments to the comma operator are always evaluated left to right, um, and in the best stable tag in the entire standard, expert.ass, we say that uh, the right operand is sequenced before the left operand in assignment. Um, in assignment expressions. So this is um, evaluation of arguments to the, to the assignment operator goes from right to left. And so that kind of explains this previous slide here, right? Is that in the comma operator, the evaluation of our sub expressions goes from left to right. And, the, and in the assignment operator, evaluation of our sub expressions goes from right to left. Um, so how do fold expressions work? So now I know not everyone is, I should have done a poll beforehand or set up a poll to see who's familiar with fold expressions and who isn't. Um, but um, I, I honestly don't have a very good idea of that. I use them all the time. I think they're fantastic. Anytime I, I have a dot, dot, dot in my arguments, I'm often reaching for a fold expression in some form. Um, but uh, fold expressions basically work like this. So if you put the dot, dot, dot on the uh, right-hand side like this, um, can people see? Yes, you can see highlighting, that's good. Um, if you put the dot, dot, dot on the right-hand side like this, you'll get um, something that groups things with parentheses from right to left. So this is called right associativity and it's enforced by the actual syntax of the fold expression itself. So this, this, I, I created a, a, a function here, an, a lambda here, just as a way of, you know, generating some symbol that is part of a pack. Um, but these two are exactly equivalent, right? Um, folding right on one, two, and three with print one is the same as running it out like this, right? Uh, it's just that in a more generic context where you don't actually know the number of arguments, it's, it's more complicated, right? And um, the same thing, this, the opposite of that is left associativity and left associativity actually um, groups the parentheses on the left. So you can remember dot, dot, dot on the left means parentheses on the left. Um, and 
all four of these cases that you can see, we've got, got the same output. And so we'll dive into exactly why that is in a second, but in, in basic form, right, where it doesn't matter how, what order we evaluate the assignment operator itself in, as long as we're evaluating the arguments in the same order. So in this case, we're evaluating print one on three, then we're evaluating print one on two, then we evaluate this assignment operator, then we evaluate print one on one, and then we evaluate this assignment operator. But since our assignment operators aren't printing anything out, we, we can't see the difference here, right? So going back over here, we evaluate print one on three, then we evaluate the left-hand side of this equal sign, which is this parenthesized expression, which causes us to evaluate print one on two, and then print one on one, and then this assignment operator, and then this assignment operator. But because we can't see the assignment operators, we can't tell this difference. Um, the opposite is happening with the comma operator. Um, I'm not gonna walk through those individually, but you get the idea there. Um, let's actually add something here that does print in its assignment operator so we can actually see what's happening in this scenario. So if we, if we add this um, blabbermouth type, which is what I call all of my types that I use to play around with these things because it's just hilarious and makes me laugh. Um, the, we have something that just prints out what it's doing inside of the assignment operator and then um, like reassigns its data member to be like the result of assigning one thing to another, right? Uh, one thing to another. And uh, that way we can kind of see what's going on uh, each time as this expression progresses, right? And so we've created a blabbermouth objects of, um, you know, three different letters here. And, and we see in the output here that in the right associative case, we get print one of C and then print one of B. And then we evaluate the assignment operator, right? Because we're still evaluating the right-hand side of this first, right? So then we evaluate the assignment operator doing assignment from C to B. Then we evaluate the left-hand side, right? Print one of A, and then we evaluate the actual assignment operator, right? And since all we were seeing before was this, this, and this, uh, Sylvester is right that the associativity itself doesn't, doesn't matter, but the associativity is a good mnemonic for remind, remembering the order in which the standard evaluates um, the arguments to an operator. So if we do the same thing the other way around, you know, the dot to dot on the left-hand side, we actually do see that the that um, the compiler evaluates this statement first, print one on C, then it tries to evaluate the left-hand side of this operator, and that involves evaluating these parentheses, which evaluates print one of B, and then evaluates print one of A, because those are the arguments to this assignment, right? And then it evaluates this assignment here, assigning from B to A, and then it evaluates this assignment here, right? So I, um, that's the end of that little trick. Did people follow that? Is that, um, I'm gonna go up to the chat and the Q and A. Um, we did a poll. Do you understand fold expressions? Yes. And uh, sometimes, and do you use fold expressions? Okay, that's actually very interesting. I would expect that um, that most people, yeah, don't actually get to use them very often in real code. I'm I'm kind of um, feel pretty lucky to have had some um, fantastic opportunities in the past to work on very generic code, and the standard library certainly uses them a lot. Um, but my feeling is that people use templates in real code way, way, way less um, than standard library implementers think they do. Um, and so I, that, that more or less lines up with my kind of more recent understanding. Um, yeah. And do you, uh, so these are updating. Wonderful. Do you understand fold expressions? I would have expected about 50, 50 in a meeting like this. And this is very interesting to find out. Um, I hope that people have a better understanding of fold expressions now. And we're really just expanding the symbol that represents multiple entities 
into the multiple entities in some interesting way, right? Um, and yeah, that's cool. 20% people. So 20% of us can hang out and have drinks and geek out over the full expressions that we use in real code. And the rest of you are welcome to join. Um, thank you, Jens. That was actually quite helpful to have a poll in there. Are there any uh, questions on this section that I can address before I move on to something completely different? I'll give it, I don't know how um, long I should give it before people do, but I, I'm guessing that this means no. We can always take, I can always take questions at the end too, um, or in the discussion at the end. So I'll just go ahead and move on to this next one. This next one was a lot of fun on Twitter this past week um, because I, posted it. And first thing that, that I mean, I, I, I talked about it in my talk. Um, and the first thing that I got is feedback was, um, was, well, I use that in my, uh, I, I use that in real code. That's not too, too cute. Uh, and then the second thing I got as feedback was, well, the C++ standard doesn't actually guarantee that this should work, which is not, those aren't really two things that you hope to, to two pieces of feedback that you hope to get alongside each other. Um, I think, I, I hope, after some discussion uh, this week, we've we've settled on the C++ standard probably guarantees this should work. Um, but uh, this is one of the things that we'll probably be filing a defect report that we need to clarify something in the standard on. Um, so anyway, what's the trick itself? Um, if you, the original trick that I posted here uh, was if you want some block of code to execute exactly once in the lifetime of your program, even the, in the presence of threads, you can put it in an immediately evaluated Lambda with a potentially unused static local variable. So I think a lot of people know this trick um, in the case where their um, static local variable uh, has some initializer that's non-trivial. But I think people often forget that like your static local variable can have a value that you don't care about if you're if the block of code you need to execute is um, doesn't return a value, it returns void, right? This feels like it it shouldn't work, but you can just make up a value and return it, and that's what I do here. Um, so like if I if I had just wanted to static initialize. I know this expression technically returns a value, but the, most people don't think of that as returning a value. So this is just like arbitrary code you wanted to evaluate. Um, you could uh, you can stick that inside of this lambda right here that we're evaluating immediately. I think I probably have highlights on this. Yeah, so you can stick this um, block of code inside of this lambda that we're evaluating immediately. That's what this open close parentheses does, right? Um, because it's a lambda that takes no arguments, I can leave out the parentheses here. Um, and um, I can just immediately call it with no arguments, right? And this will get executed um, when the static variable is initialized. Now let's take a look at, oh, and here I'm running this to just show that it works with a very large number of threads in this case, two, um, because that was the number of threads that Godbolt supported at the time. Um, and yeah, so let's take a look at the, the code generated by this and, and see what's really going on here. Um, so I have this, I've simplified my example even further just to make the, the output. So this is the in, in Compiler Explorer, just an excellent tool if you're not uh, aware of it. Um, oh, okay, there's a QA. and a um, Yes, Funathan has a fantastic, Funathan.net has a fantastic um, resource on fold expressions. Thanks for pulling that up. That's absolutely something that I um, should have mentioned in the talk. I'll have to add it into a future version. That's one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite metaprogramming blog posts out there. Um, Jonathan Miller is an excellent blogger on C++. You should definitely read some of his posts. Um, Okay, so going back to this. Um, so uh, running this through Compiler, Explo Compiler Explorer, you can get the kind of x86 output. Um, and we've, we've 
made this a little bit simpler even still because like if i were to actually print out here there'd be a few more instructions generated that would make things a lot more complicated to read and i wanted this all to fit on the slide and i feel like a fair percentage of people can recognize um plus equals one in a um in an x86 code snippet um it's right here spoiler alert um and that that way we can like kind of get some idea of what the compiler is adding around this exclusive execution segment to make this conform to the requirements of the C++ standard. So I've actually gotten feedback from a number of people in uh, this and in a subsequent example that basically said, well, bar needs to be atomic. This, this absolutely needs to be atomic. I don't understand what in the C++ standard would apply that bar um, you know, has atomic behavior and, and doesn't need to be atomic. Um, and hopefully we'll understand this by the end here. There is there is one caveat to that that makes this a lot more complicated, but um, yeah. So let's walk through this. Uh, so what is the compiler doing here? This seems like it should be doing less than this and it's it's, it's actually um, not. It, it has to load this guard variable, um, guard variable for foo colon colon unused. Um, and then checks to see if it's uh, non-zero, uh, checks to see if it's zero, sorry. If it is, then it needs to try and run the actual initialization. So it calls CXA guard acquire with the guard variable. Um, if that acquire was successful, it jumps to label L14 and uh, otherwise it just returns. So let's look at the code inside of the, the guard acquire here. And there's our actual uh, bar plus equals one, right? And then we are calling uh, guard release uh, with the guard variable, right? Which also, um, you know, guarantees this exclusive execution behavior. There's some other uh, lines here that are just manipulating the stack pointer, which have to do with ABI. Um, but that's that's basically what's going on here. Um, we have the compilers inserted essentially a mutex, right? Um, or a single um, they call once flag, something in between a mutex and a call once flag here, right? Um, around this snippet of code that does the initialization of unused, right? Even though the initialization, even though bar is completely unrelated to the initialization of unused, the standard isn't really opinionated on that, right? You said this is the code to initialize the Boolean variable unused, and the compiler just has to trust you on that. Um, and so that's, that's what we're exploiting here in order to get this code to run exactly once. Wow, I've already used 30 minutes. All right. This is, um, hopefully this means that I'm, you're getting a little bit more of a detailed view, a little bit more of a slowed down view of this talk than I was able to give at CBPCon. Um, but let's talk about why this is happening. So basically statement.decl slash four, um, which is actually, I have need to correct this. This is actually statement.decl slash three. Um, I got the wrong number in there. Uh, but basically uh, says dynamic initialization of a block variable with static storage duration or thread storage duration. So um, blocks, block variable is the C++ standardies for local variable in this particular context. Um, ooh, we can jump back and, and answer that question. I don't understand the absolute jump. I didn't either for a second. This is just a tail call optimization, Peter. Um, so I didn't recognize that either. If you actually run this through Godbolt um, with uh, Clang instead of, oh yeah, here's the, the Clang version actually in this screenshot. I, this is the GCC version in this because I thought it was fit better into the slide. But if you look at the, the Clang version here, you actually see that it's annotated as tail call. So hopefully that um, helps you understand that um, absolute jump there. Um, yeah, no problem. I, I was confused by that for a second too. So I definitely had to go back and, and look at it. 
Um, all right, so yeah, dynamic initialization of a block variable with static storage duration is performed the first time control passes through its declaration. Well, the interesting thing about this statement is that um, it doesn't say anything about happens before, which is the the um, which is the language that we use to describe concurrency now. So it says if a concurrent if control enters the declaration concurrently, the concurrent execution shall wait for the completion of the initialization. Um, so that um, is an interesting statement in that it doesn't use very modern language about concurrency in the standard. And you're going to see that that has caused quite a bit of confusion. And I'm uh, interested to see how it's resolved. I can't imagine it's going to be resolved without changing this wording a little bit. I also haven't gone and checked, but I suspect that means that this wording is pre C11 wording. We didn't have a better way of saying happens before. But the other interesting thing in this this uh, snippet when I when I looked this up to make this slide was, oh, if initialization exits by throwing an exception, the initialization is not complete. So it'll be tried again the next time. This gives me a really bad idea. So I went to Twitter and um, posted a, another uh, bonus cute trick of the day where we basically are using the same thing, right? This is the code from last time, right? This is our essentially the same code from last time. We have this uh, unused variable, we have something executing and we're returning true. But we're gonna add something in here and that is we're gonna catch a particular type of exception and um, we're going to initialize a count variable to zero and every time we reach this spot in the code we're going to increment that count variable and if we're less than the times that we want to run we're going to throw this exception so we didn't finish the static initializer right that means that going back to our to this slide it says um you know exits by throwing exception uh will be tried again the next time right so we, we're, we're just making sure that the static initialization doesn't complete non-exceptionally. Um, and uh, then if, if we have done it the right number of times, we just return true and, and the static initialization is complete. And the next time it's reached, um, things are okay. So uh, we can also use this principle to like build our own mutex, um, which, spoiler alert, you should probably just use a mutex instead. Um, yes, you can use this to build a thread safe singleton, um, which is also an interesting application of this. And that's kind of fun to play around with. I'm not sure whether that's a good idea or not. I mean, some of these, some of these tricks are borderline, like not too cute. Um, I mean, I think your definition of too cute has to depend on who's reading your code. Right. And if someone if it's it's going to be a trick that um, someone hasn't seen before, um, then it's probably too cute because code is always written to be read, right? Whether that person is you in several months or in most professional environments, it's written to be read by dozens of people over the lifetime of the code base. Um, so I'm not going to go through this. This is, I think, pretty unsurprising that if you were to just not increment the count and just always exit be an exception, this would run exclusively. I do want to get into this fun tweet that I got from Dave Abrams after looking at my talk, where he says, uh, sadly, I think this one has a data race. And I was like, oh, that would be sad. Um, so I did quite a bit of code archaeology on this. I went through long Twitter discussions with a number of people who are experts and who wrote some of this code for the compilers. and. Um, Looks like this might be a bug in TSAN. Uh, this is the code snippet, more or less, that um, Dave Abrams sent me, where he basically compiled with dash f sanitize equals thread up here in this. I know you can't see it very well because it's small, but um, it's just the dash f sanitize equals thread flag. This works on both GCC and on Clang. And, and, um, TSAN says, oh, there's a data race here. Uh, 
read of size four on thread six at, at line 11, oh, that's incrementing of the count. And then that was used to say, oh, you, you know, count should have been atomic here for this to work correctly. But remember what we just learned, right? This block of code is guaranteed to execute exclusively. Um, this, this code was, is guaranteed to execute exclusively by the compiler, right? And um, so we shouldn't need to do anything atomic here, right? Uh, well, there's some question there, right? Because remember, the, the standard doesn't say anything about happens before. So the compiler isn't necessarily required to establish happens before relationships between blocks of code executing this way. It's just required to make them execute exclusively. Problem is that with my somewhat limited, but I would think generally a little bit extensive knowledge of um, of how atomics work and how uh, memory ordering works, I can't think of a way where you could create exclusive execution without accidentally establishing a happens before relationship uh, with the way that C++ exists today. There are some proposals that have been made that would allow for asynchronous fencing or uh, for uh, location specific, address specific fencing um, that apply to certain architectures, but haven't really been um, built out in C++. So I, I suspected this was a, a, a bug and I took a deeper dive on the TSAN implementation of these things. So when TSAN, when, when the um, compiler generates this exclusive snippet, it goes, um, if it exits via an exception, it calls CXA guard abort, which basically releases the guard without incrementing it. Um, and it, if it exits via a normal value, it calls CXA guard release. Um, it's not specified to do this, by the way. This is just practically speaking how um, most implementations do this on top of Linux. Um, and TSAN uh, shims these methods. Uh, but surprisingly, it's it's shimming them differently, and I don't know why that is. Um, but uh, in guard release, it's actually shimming this as an atomic exchange with memory order release right here on line four. Whereas in uh, guard abort, it's shimming it with this memory order relaxed, right? And so it's it's actually there's also another bug here where it's it's waking up a few texts uh, in the release case, and it actually is just completely forgetting to do that in the abort case. So that's very definitely a bug in TSAN that needs to be fixed. Um, so if anyone wants to be, um, you know, have make an actual contrib contribution to TSAN, um, that's a fun little weekend project for you. Um, but Let's look at what libcxx actually does, um, the underlying implementation when we're not running with the thread sanitizer. We actually see that um, the release and abort code both do an exchange that has acquire release uh, semantics. Technically speaking, that could be relaxed release, um, could just be release but uh, it's even doing stronger than that. I don't know that there would be any difference on any architecture that I can think of. Somebody can come up with an example that would be interesting, but um, in terms of actual consequences in, in memory ordering, I think this is pretty similar. Anyway, the point is that uh, the underlying actual implementation that you're gonna be running on is in fact doing the right thing and doing a memory order release. It's just that TSAN's wrapper to it is uh, not attributing memory order release to CXA guard abort. And I think this is, I think this is probably because the standard is, um, the standard is underspecified in this area. I talked to Olivier uh, about this briefly last night. We went back and forth several times. Uh, there was some confusion. And eventually we came to the conclusion that, oh yeah, this looks like, um, something has gone wrong here, paper welcome. So yeah, if that's something that someone wants to write a paper on, um, reach out to me, reach out to someone else, uh, reach out to Olivier. We know exactly what the paper needs to say more or less, it's just has, needs to be written. Um, so what should you do in real code? 
Um, wow, I'm at 42 minutes already. Okay. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to keep going until I get through um, the same set of tricks that I uh, went through in at CVPCon, if that's okay with people. And um, if people get tired of that, or if I get kicked off of this, then I'll um, stop. But I think this is interesting. I'm, I'm really enjoying getting to go through these things a little bit less breakneck speed, speed than I had to go through them at CVPCon to fit into the hour. So I hope you all are enjoying this too. Um, so in, in real code, we have uh, something called std call once that does a call once. And you're gonna see here in a second why some people think that the original trick that I showed is not necessarily too cute. Um, and it's because std call once is a little bit heavier weight than you would think. It actually does a call out to pthread once. Um, but it has the same semantics as the original code snippet. And so if you really are in performance sensitive code and you really do care about the cost of running this thing that runs once in the entirety of your program, uh, you can consider using that trick. But honestly, I would suspect that in most cases, readability trumps performance and the performance difference is not substantial here. But I would suspect that readability trumps performance and pretty much every common use of this, this call once pattern. So using std call once and std once flag is, is generally the recommended practice here. But don't be too surprised if you see the original trick in real code. All of the rest of this, there are much better ways to do this in real code. Um, exiting via an exception in order to create a mutex effectively is, um, is a terrible idea. You should actually just use a mutex to effectively create a mutex because um, uh, yeah, um, use the, the thing that's named what you mean, not the thing that does what you mean. Um, and so here we've used a mutex, we've used a std scope lock. If you're in pre C++ 17, you can use a std lock guard here, um, but either will work. And then we're calling the function and then the uh, lock gets released when we exit the scope, either by exception or by, uh, either by exception or by value. And yeah, this works exactly the same way. Not too surprising. Finally, if you really need to execute something the first n times in real code, you should probably rethink your life decisions. But if you have finished rethinking your life decisions and you still need exactly that semantic, you can do this with um, an atomic and a mutex together. Um, oh yeah, I apologize to everyone in, who's still awake. Um, uh, it is eight o'clock. I started at eight o'clock in, in, in Germany, right? So, um, I will try and get in the rest of this talk without going over by more than 15 minutes or so. Um, so hopefully that doesn't make a big difference in your, um, in your sleep time. Uh, but if it does, I apologize. And I'm happy to talk through the slides are available. I'm happy to talk through them on Twitter. I love talking about this stuff. This kind of, um, you know, C++ education via playground is, I think, my new favorite way of communicating. So I'm, I'm happy to communicate on Twitter about all of these things. Um, anyway, I'm going to jump to trick number five because that's um, another one that kind of sits on its own. Tricks three and four kind of go together. And, and um, tricks three and four are also, if you end up having to drop off, you know, you're missing kind of one whole chunk of things um, that'll probably end up in some form in some other talk at some point. So that might be a little bit better to skip to trick number five here. Um, I think this one's not actually too cute, but um, that also depends on what your uh, readers think. And if your readers don't recognize uh, deduction guides, if your readers don't recognize uh, class template argument deduction, CTAD, uh, then maybe this is too cute and you should just write out the whole thing. But yeah, so C++ 17 deduction guys make class template argument deduction uh, easier than ever. And um, to especially to do this rule of zero with aggregates. Um, so 
let's look at what's going on here. We basically have this class template that's actually very generic, right? It's like, this is like exactly stood pair with, you know, a few things missing, right? But like more or less a lot of, um, uh, you know, there's a little bit of the infrastructure around it missing, but right, this is like an aggregate version of stood pair. It's incredibly generic. We can do a lot with it. Um, and that's all of the code it took to write it, right? Um, and and we had to add this 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 one little thing called the deduction guide. I don't know how many of you work with those or have seen those in your daily life. They were added in C plus plus seventeen to allow us to do class template argument deduction more efficiently, right? To to deduce these T's and U's. Um, more efficiently and help the compiler figure out how to how to do it right and so there are some some of these that get generated automatically uh particularly if you have a certain type of compiler a uh, certain type of constructor right if you have a constructor that takes a t and a u and your class template um arguments are t and u then the compiler will automatically generate this deduction guide for you essentially um, And uh, so anyway, you can you can see how this gets used down here. Um, with this, all we have to do is open and close curly braces. We're not having to do any angle brackets here, um, which will make certainly some people happy. Um, and these are all just deducing the type directly uh, from this deduction guide. So an innocent question, uh, wouldn't it be uh nice if we could just omit this deduction guide and so those of you who saw the cpp con talk um will uh know the joke here but who thinks we should add this to the standard i didn't i, I almost set up a poll for this ahead of time but um i think that it's probably faster to just go go through this um as it is, because the joke is that, um, well, who thinks we should add it to the standard? Who thinks I'm adding leading, asking leading questions about something that's already in the standard? And it turns out that this is actually already in the standard, thanks to uh, Timur Dubler, Timur, I actually don't know Timur's last name because no one else is named Timur, but uh, starts with a D, I think. Um, um, yeah, somebody can tag his, Twitter in um, chat. Um, he was just sitting in the room at the talk, so I could be like, hey, thanks, Timur. But Timur wrote a paper that, that does this um, and means that for aggregates you, you, that directly correspond uh, between the, the aggregate uh, arguments to constructing the aggregate and the template parameters, you don't need this deduction guide. It automatically gets generated by the compiler. And this does, in fact, work. Um, and this uh, works fine as long as uh, you have this um, this feature macro defined, and it's it's higher than that. If the compiler defines this feature macro and higher than that, and so a full implementation of C plus plus twenty does actually have to implement this. Uh, Clang doesn't do that yet, which is why I put this on the slide. Um, latest version of Clang still hasn't implemented this yet. So uh, keep that in mind if you need to support Clang or if you need to support pre C++ 20 code, then you don't actually get to do this. Teamer audio, thank you. I knew something involving audio. Uh, Teamer is great and there's a lot of things on his plate with respect to the committee. So if you wanna collaborate with him on a paper um, and do most of the work and then get his help with the final bits, I'm sure he would really enjoy it. Um, he's a really nice guy. So the original trick that I posted was this one, where I basically did something a little bit more complicated than just directly deducing the template parameters from um, aggregate, um, from the automatic deduction guide created by the aggregate. And in this case, instead, I'm deducing uh, the U here in the initializer list and saying that that u gets mapped to the u in foo, which we then are mapping to the argument of std vector in, inside here, right? So there's there's actually a fairly complicated thing going on, but notice that the definition of our class has not gotten any more complicated, really, right? 
Um, so there's, there's a lot of powerful things you can do with this trick. So here's an interesting question, and now we're going to get towards the um, second, um, or rather sequentially the first, but the second in the, the talk. Um, uh, defect report will probably be filed against the standard as a result of preparing this talk. Um, what about designated initializers? In C++20, we finally added designated initializers for aggregates to uh, C++, given that C has had them since uh, 1998. It's kind of surprising how long it took us to do that, but I think it's good that we waited this long because we, we took uh, our time to really find out what it means for something to be an aggregate in C++ and uh, apply the syntax directly that way. There's also some uh, things involving side effects that we needed to do in a very C++ -y way that C doesn't do. So we don't allow you, for instance, to put the um, put the designators out of order. They have to be in the same order as they are in the class, and that's because we don't want to confuse anybody with the side effects of the constructors uh, happening in a different order than they're written in the code. So in this case, yeah, um, one would expect that this should work, and in GCC it does. Fails to compile in Clang, but Clang doesn't set the detection guides greater than 2019-7, so it's okay, right? Oops. Um, no, uh, it turns out that we underspecified this in the standard. Um, and the standard does specify that designated initializers with CTAD uh, but without deduction guides should work fine. This is in some of the wording that Teamer added to C++20. Um, there are, it specifically states that if there are no deduction guides, then um, the entries in the braced initializer list can be an initializer list or designated initializer list. Um, and dot, 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 it basically goes on to say CTAD happens. Um, but basically, if you look through that section, it's over.match.class.deduct. So you can um, see that this is part of overload uh, uh, handling, right? And uh, even from the stable tag without reading the context in the standard. And basically, the CTAD mechanism performs initialization and overload resolution on the set of deduction guides, right? Both the implicitly generated ones, um, both the implicitly generated ones and the uh, ones written into the code um, and decides like which one is gonna be used to determine the uh, class template arguments. And, but the standard doesn't, say what happens with overload resolution when there's designated initializers around. And there's a really good reason for this um, because overload resolution is really, really hard. And we don't have any other instances where we would use designated initializers as arguments for overload resolution, only in this particular case when we're constructing an aggregate. So we forgot to say something in the standard and uh, hopefully this will be clarified pretty soon. Should this work once we have, um, once we clarify this? Probably not, uh, but that's ongoing work as of last week. I think it's still ongoing and it'll probably be in the next uh, standard. So let's go, I'm gonna jump into tricks three and four really quickly. I think I have more or less, if I'm gonna stay within my self allocated time limit of 15 minutes over, I have about 20 minutes, and then we can have a, some excellent discussion out in the, the lobby about this. Um, anything remotely tangential to initialize your list is just a dumpster fire. That is absolutely true. Um, this in particular is relating more to aggregates and to CTAD. Um, and initialize your list there just happens to be a stand in for something that I was um, deducing directly and then propagating into the into CTAD via deduction guide. Uh, but yes, I, I totally agree initializer lists are a dumpster fire. Um, I agree that um, uh, aggregate initialization is is much less of a dumpster fire since Teamer started working on it um, in 2020. 
but uh, still has uh, for C plus plus twenty. He started working on it long before then in order for it to make C plus plus twenty. But um, more or less, uh, yeah. There's there's several dumpster fires going on here, um, and I wish we could go back and fix them, but we can't. Um, so let's talk about parameter packs for a second. Um, parameter packs we talked about a little bit earlier um, in the the fold example. Um, and Eric Niebler says that if we're doing any kind of kind of metaprogramming, parameter pa param parameter packs are the compile time data structure of to choice. As of C plus plus eleven, C plus plus has language support for lists of types. We would be foolish to use anything else, and that's. Um, referring more or less to pre-C++11 metaprogramming, which involved um, recursively uh, instantiating templates in order to create lists um, of types for metaprogramming purposes, uh, sort of in a uh, Lisp style card and cutter type approach. Um, now that we have uh, a standard language feature for uh, compile time lists, basically, uh, we'd be foolish to use anything else. And I agree with, with, um, I agree with Eric on that. So let's talk about how we enumerate um, a parameter pack. And I have a comment here that indexing over enumerating or indexing into um, parameter packs are perhaps the tasks with the greatest discrepancy between how difficult they should be and how difficult they actually are. C++20 makes this substantially easier. Um, and I'm going to show you how here. Uh, so this is probably the most important. This, this piece here, this next piece here, is what the rest of part of what the rest of the talk hinges on. So I'm going to go through it very uh, carefully and try to explain it a couple of times. Um, so if we often find ourselves in this situation where we have, you know, a single name args, right? That is representing multiple things, right? Hello, 42 world and 43. And they all have different types, right? Um, in this case, we're using the, um, we're using C++ 20 uh, uh, terse concepts notation here, right? So this is actually a template, even though we didn't use the keyword template. It's just that these are unconstrained template parameters unconstrained anonymous template parameters, right? We don't have a name for the actual type. We don't have a symbol that represents this pack, um, the type of this pack in this context, only the values. Uh, we can get it through decal type if we want to, but uh, it turns out since we didn't need the type, a symbol to represent the type in this pack, I went ahead and used this terse syntax so that you'd learn something new, hopefully, from that. Um, and so we're, we're in this example, we're trying to call we're trying to write a function, uh, enumerate pack, that um, takes a function, takes a callback, and um, a variadic set of arguments, right? And we're trying to call that function once with each argument in that pack, right? Along with the index into that pack, right? So we should get a call of this with zero and hello, one and 42, two and world. Right, we're trying to do that generically. So here's how we do it. This used to be a lot, lot more complicated. Um, and now that we have this feature in C20 that allows us to explicitly name uh, template parameters of lambdas, this is a lot, lot more terse. And it's this, this is the key here, right? We basically need some way to create a parameter pack. I'm going to try and say this twice. Um, does auto dot 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 pass args by value? Yes. Uh, for production, you would want to sit forward this stuff. It's a little more complicated than that, too, because um, this, um, be careful about this, because this this ampersand capture messes with your, your uh, std forwarding. Uh, so perfect forwarding through a reference, a capture by reference is actually harder than you think it is. And there's some surprising edge cases because you end up accidentally forwarding out of the data member of the Lambda itself. Um, I intentionally left that off of this slide because it just makes a lot of noise. Um, 
for production, you should, yes, definitely spend a few days rethinking your life decisions. And if you still are set on needing to do this in production, then yes, you should sit forward and hide it away in code that no one ever has to read. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing. I've written this in production code like 10 times. So um, I you know, had to use this before for sure with, with perfect forwarding. Um, but yeah, I, I left out perfect forwarding in all of these examples actually for um, simplicity. So here we need to have a way to have a symbol that represents the indices of the pack in one symbol, right? We have something that represents the values in the pack of one as one symbol. We need a way to represent the indices in the pack as one symbol. And then the idea is that we should be able to expand both of those packs at the same time over a fold on the comma operator, right? Remember we talked about folding over the comma operator earlier and how that evaluates left to right, which is exactly what we wanna do here, right? So it turns out if you have two packs, two or more packs of the same length, you can always expand them together over dot, 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 just in the same way that you would expand a single pack, right? And so we're gonna use that to our advantage here. And so what we need to do is we need to use this std make index sequence, right? Which makes an index sequence object, it's technically an integer sequence object and index sequence is a type alias um, template for it, but it works the same way. Index, we're gonna, it's gonna make this index sequence object right here um, that has um, the parameter pack zero, one, two, dot, 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 up to size of arcs, right? So make index sequence is specified as a helper template that basically does exactly what we asked for. But we still need a way to associate a named symbol with that pack. And to do that, we need to um, deduce a template parameter from this um, from this function, from this the parameters to this function, right? Uh, before C20, we couldn't do that because we couldn't give explicit names to these things. But now we can give a name to this parameter pack uh, of indices that comes in as part of student index six when we call this, right? So, um, uh, dangling in front of your eyes makes the code so obvious. Um, oh, well, um, I'm glad that this has helped with that, honestly. Um, I, I hope that this makes this more obvious. This to me was, saves an enormous amount of jumping around code. You used to have to put this in a, in a separate function template and that caused lots of jumping around in code that made template metacode like this very difficult to read. I wouldn't even call this template metacode. This is just like code that is generic over number of arguments, right? Any code that's generic over the number of arguments. It's just being generic. It's not template metaprogramming in my book, but I have a pretty loose definition of template metaprogramming, um, you know, for my own purposes at least. Um, so anyway, the point here is that we've, we've generated a parameter pack. We've generated a name for it, right? And we have those two names in the same scope. And once we have two names in the same scope, we can always expand over a, um, a fold expression uh, or do anything else that we can do with a pack, we can do with with two packs or in any number of packs, right? Um, and so that's what we're doing here. And that actually causes us to call the function with the indices and the arguments um, in a way that is bordering on readable if you see this, but it's, it's these two lines that you're gonna see over and over again throughout the rest of the talk. And I'm running up against my limit, but I think I might still make it. Um, so you can do the same thing, use the same trick to index into a parameter pack. Um, this is not the recommended way of indexing into a parameter pack. Uh, if you wanna read Louis, if you wanna read way, way, way more detail on this, and so one of my uh, favorite blog posts on C++ metaprogramming of all time, Louis Dion has this fantastic um, post on the various ways of indexing into parameter packs and um, does some very solid benchmarking of what you should really do in production code and how fast it should be. Um, and yeah, 
So that's that's this here. Um, but one thing we can do is if we're going through this same thing as before, only this time we have a the user giving us a template parameter of the exact spot that they want us to um, invoke the function with, right? Instead of just calling the function with all the arguments, we can just create a function here that says if idx says equals equals i, right? Um, then call f of args, right? And then we're just expanding that immediately evaluated lambda over the comma operator, just like before. Um, and with some tweaks, actually, we can even reuse this function before. We have, have to do something special that involves passing IDXS as a explicit template argument rather than as a value argument uh, because of the way Const Explorer works in C++. But it's more or less the same concept, right? You can see how we got from that last slide to this slide. And we're just using if Const Explorer. And so once you have this once you have this kind of pair of lines and you know how this pair of lines works, this, um, the world is your oyster. You, the world is your oyster. The world is your oyster. Um, and you can kind of, you can do a lot of things, a lot of, a lot of metaprogramming and uh, generic programming over count of arguments boils down to something like this. Um, and we're gonna see this in the next, trick really quickly, which I have five minutes for, but this one is just so freaking cute that I couldn't leave it, leave it out. Uh, this comes courtesy of Richard Smith, which if you don't know Richard Smith, one of the, the nicest people you'll ever meet and certainly like the highest niceness times C++ knowledge ratio of anyone you'll ever meet. And that would probably be true regardless of how nice he is, but um, he's just, off the charts on that um, latter category, I guess. Um, but he sent me back a trick, uh, a response to one of my other tricks and and included essentially this in it without even thinking of it as like um, anything special. Um, so we're in the same situation as we were before, right? Where we have this dot, 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 we have this one symbol named args that represents a whole bunch of other things, and we need some way to get at the last argument. Surprisingly, that's difficult, right? Getting at the first argument is really easy. You can just give an explicit parameter and then a dot, 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 and the dot, dot, dot will deduce the rest of it. But you can't give a dot, 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 and then an explicit parameter in C++ because, um, because well, I don't actually know. Um, I asked a bunch of people who were around when that decision was made, the best answer I got was that there's some simplifications were made when we were doing C++11 because we weren't sure how hard it was going to be for compilers to do this. Um, but anyway, we have basically our same little two lines here that we have from before. So for this time we've done args minus one, right? So now we have two different packs that have different links. And I'm going to say show you something that's really interesting um, that you can do when you have packs of different lengths um, and still end up with uh, an interesting result. So here uh, we have a C++ 20 concept, right? Um, and it's kind of this non, kind of this trivial concept where remember uh, any C++ 20 concepts take the type that they're matching against as the first template parameter and then any other explicit parameters come after that, right? So this concept any just takes a, a number and ignores it and returns true for any type, right? So we have any um, IDXS auto dot, dot, dot. And by the way, if you wanna see the perfect forwarding version of this, Richard has a tweet where he does it kind of trivially, trivially off the top of his head without even having to think about it. Uh, which involves a nasty, nasty expression written inside of here and some other stuff. Um, I usually, when I come across this and absolutely have to do perfect forwarding, I'll be honest, I just don't capture anything in either place. And I just pass the parameter pack through forward through each level uh, because I'm not smart enough to figure out how to perfect forward out of a reference capture. So that's a trick if you're interested in perfect forwarding here. 
um, and I have three minutes, so I'm going to try and go through how this works. So remember, we've been past a pack with one less index, right? And we can actually, once we have a name for a pack anywhere, we can kind of use it in pretty much any place where we could use any other identifier, right? And one of those places is in defining constraints on a, um, a parameter to a function, right? So if we have a lambda inside of the scope where we have this parameter pack, we can use it to define a set of parameters. So we know from, from here that we're going to have size of args minus one different entries in IDXS, right? So because this is not no longer a deduced parameter, this is an explicit parameter, right? We are expanding out over this rather than deducing this pack. And we happen to use dot, dot, dot in both cases. Actually, if you ever read Richard's code, he's probably one of the only people who fully understands this distinction, but he will, when he is deducing versus expanding, he will use a um, dot, dot, dot that is left aligned to the type name for expanding and right aligned to the parameter for deducing um, because those situations are actually distinct and um, we just happen to use the same syntax. I think that's very funny. I, I've never done it myself and I'm honestly not always um, clear on what's going on even after years of doing this. But um, what we're expanding here explicitly is IDXS, right? We're saying there are n minus one parameters here. So this is no longer a pattern. And then the last parameter should be named last, right? And then we can just call the function and we have the world's funniest hello world program here. So I thought that was really cute and really interesting use of, um, of uh, concepts and parameter packs. Yes, you can use this to get any entry in a parameter pack um, just by going minus n here and then deducing a parameter pack at the end here. I just wanted to keep this example simple. Uh, why can't we have nice things? Well, we're working on nicer things. That's the goal of the standard committee. But um, this basically is what I was saying would be the easier way to do this, right? Is we could just deduce the last parameter. Um, that doesn't work. We hit core engine has a, has a fork of Clang that does do this um, and a proposal to add this to C++. And um, everyone I've asked from the committee is like, well, I don't see any fundamental reason why this can't be in the standard. It's just that we wanted a single pass left to right version of this the first time through. So that's all I've got for this talk. Um, let's go back to, I don't, don't even have a, um, I don't even have a title page, do I? Um, I have, I don't have a questions page, but I have a title page. I think I'm supposed to go, Yin can tell, say more, but I think I'm supposed to go to a uh, room for discussion afterwards. Is that right? Or yes. take questions directly? Um, so first, if you have any questions to Daisy right now, maybe post them to the chat that we can see them. Also, thank you for your talk, Daisy. That was awesome. I enjoyed it very much. And I think the audience also had a lot of fun. I see the chat. Um, I kind of uh, made sure that the room starts uh, a little bit later, so that it opens during your talk. Um, I think like from like 20 on, I can open the room and then people can go there and just talk and nerd out with everything, you know, with the slides and um, I think I'm going to then end the recording now. And um, Awesome, yay. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. I appreciate it.